Okay, shall I just, um, uh, shall I just start? Um, uh, for those of you who've, um, who've just been in David's speech, um, this is a story about being wrong. Um, it's a story about some, uh, a, a big educational initiative in, in the UK that I'm a maths educator. Um, and maths educators universally thought that uh, this was rubbish. And uh, it looks like, actually, it was quite good. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk in general about education in, in England and the reforms um, that have happened over the past 30 or 40 years. But I, th I thought it would be useful just to, just to tell you some things about, about, about England. The UK is four nations. And they have four educational systems. One of those is really different from the others, and one of them is becoming very different from the others. Scotland is hugely different, and England is becoming even more different to the others. Compulsory schooling ends at 18. That's quite recent. Um, they, we talk in years, not grades. And for our, for, our, for our year, you add one to grade. So grade four is year five in, the, um, in, in England, not in Scotland. Um, and we have primary and secondary, and we, we end primary at 11. We have national examinations at 16, 17, and 18. These are kind of end of school examinations. You might wonder why we have those. It's just our history. Um, it, those examinations at 16, I think, are possibly the worst thing in terms of our education system and keeping it, keeping it where it is. Um, up, upper secondary is gets increasingly specialised. Unlike Sweden, we've we've got we've got a specialising and more specialising system as you go through. Um, we've got a comprehensive system, but comprehensivisation was never fully uh, was never fully completed, and uh, education in the UK is terribly political. Uh, it's surrounded by political values, and politicians disagree intensely about, about, about education. Here's a quote that I'm going to frame my talk around. I do not join those who paint a lurid picture of educational decline because I do not believe it's generally true, although there are examples which give cause for concern. I'm raising a further question. It is this. In today's world, higher standards are demanded than were required yesterday, and there are simply fewer jobs for those without skill. Therefore, we demand more from our schools than did our grandparents. That's a quote from the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister in the 1970s. Really famous speech in, uh, in, in, in the UK, the Ruskin speech that set off a whole train of reform, starting with a national curriculum and en encompassing reform around accountability, around assessment, around pedagogy and around professional development. So that's the, that's the 1970s. Fast forward to 2011. And here's Michael Gove, our then Secretary of State for Education, saying, just before Christmas, the most comprehensive survey of global educational achievement ever conducted showed just how daunting the challenge is. We haven't been progressing relative to our competitors. We've been retreating. In the last 10 years, we've plummeted in the rankings from 4th to 16th for science, 7th to 25th for literacy, and 8th to 28th for maths. There's a real contrast in those, in those, two, in those two quotes in terms of the blame on the educational system and in terms of, in terms of the, the analysis of the problem. And that kind of bears on what's happened in... Uh, in in education in in England, Jim Callaghan in the 1970s looking forward to the possibility, not saying it was all rubbish, and uh, then Michael Gove having of course Michael Gove isn't he's a he's a conservative politician. Jim Callaghan was a, a Labour politician, but it, it's not about it's not about I think about the political flavor flavors of their of their of their politics. It's more about politicians have limited levers to pull and they get increased they've got increasingly frustrated with the, the glacial change of education and uh, it's um, it's um, colored this this debate in the UK we have 
we, we are particularly keen on this, this debate about, about standards. Here's, here's, a, here's a graph that shows how, um, how the performance at our age 16 national examination has improved since the 1950s. This might be a cause for celebration. The, the kids are more engaged with education. They get more certification. They're doing better. And in some ways, that, that, that's, 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 that's true. But this has, this has also been the cause for a debate around whether the standards of those examinations have, 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 been, have, 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 have been maintained. And uh, 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 a scare story about, about whether they, they, they have been maintained at all. I mean, in fact, they haven't. Um, although um, the this is mathematics, in the no early 1980s, about 23% of kids got uh, what we call an A star to C. It's a, it's a kind of pass rate. Uh, it's it's the it's the getting the examination that counts for various things. And it went up to 58% in 2012. It's gone up and down since a little bit. But there's a considerable there is a considerable slippage in those standards. And uh, Rob Coe has shown that. Uh, uh, a, a C in 2006 was worth a D in 1996 in terms of kids' other achievement in, in, in other areas. We can also look at um, international comparisons, um, and I've looked at two here. Pisa is always the one that's quoted now. I don't, I, I not quite sure why, because uh, politicians really want us to do well on TIMS. TIMS is a much more traditional, um, uh, traditional test. So uh, TIMS goes back to, since, uh, to 1995, um, and uh, the grade four results have, um, have uh, risen substantially um, from 484, which is below average, to 542, which is well above average. Um, the grade eight, um, have, um, um, I mean, it looks like there's a rise there. There actually isn't a rise. Those, are, those, are, those figures are not statistically diffi di different from, um, uh, from the average at 500. And in, in PISA, well, since 2003, we've, 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 gone, we've gone down a bit. We haven't actually. When um, John Mickelwright did the analysis on PISA, he reckoned that the 508 was really a 500. There was a bias in the in 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 the uh, results, but it does look like there's been a rise in primary, but that rise isn't maintained into secondary, and that's that's a cause for concern, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, since um, the 1970s, there's been a lot of reform in education. Um, at this is just a few of the things, and I, 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 I had to put this. You, you notice that some of you won't be able to read this. It's in a tiny type, and I, I mean, I've, I've actually got about half of the major reforms, and about five percent of all the reforms. So this is this is a, this is a, this is a situation. You can see why Michael Gove is worried. He's they've tried all sorts of things, and and it hasn't it hasn't it hasn't seemingly seemingly worked. Um, here's, here's back to that Tim's data for, for primary. So, so actually what's happened when we look in, in, in the intervening years, we can, see a, we can see a big jump from 1995 to 2003, and then we've maintained. And that maintaining suggests to me that we've done something, something that is relatively significant. So what happened in that intervening period between 1995 and 2003? Well, in, in 1997, we had, uh, we had a new Labour government. Um, and it was a new Labour government that it labelled itself as new Labour. It broke with the past. Tony Blair came in and his big slogan in that election was education, education, education. So education was a major focus. And in fact, primary education was a major focus. And primary mathematics and literacy, uh, or, and, and English, though it was termed numeracy and, 
and literacy. I should say, as a maths educator at the time, we hated the term numeracy. And again, I think we were wrong then. Um, so uh, there, were, there were two big initiatives in, in, in primary, the National Numeracy Strategy and the National Literacy Strategy. They ran from 1998 to 2010, so just over a decade. Um, but there was another thing that happened in this period. TIMS was administered three months later. And what does that do? Well, for primary, there's probably a developmental effect. So sitting the test three months later probably had an effect on, uh, uh, effect on the results of the, of the test. So, so that gain here was probably partly due to this initiative in primary and partly due to the developmental effect of sitting the test later. But was it really due to that to, to that test in to that initiative? Well, let's look at look at what the evidence suggests. Firstly, some aspects about about the national numeracy strategy. Um, the national numeracy strategy came in with this is a picture of um, the framework for teaching mathematics. Um, unlike unlike the the old national curriculum which is quite a short document full of statements that led to attainment targets that were used to assess kids. This was a very detailed pedagogical manual of how to teach and the kinds of examples that you might use in your teaching. It, it ran to 400 pages or so. So it's a very, very detailed, detailed manual. Um, and that went alongside a huge change in the structure of lessons. Uh, we had um, the introduction of the three-part lesson. It was a whole, cast, a whole class approach to teaching, but it was, it was a three-part lesson. It started with us. I mean, three parts. What, what can have a beginning and middle and an end? So it had a starter, it had a main activity, and it had a plenary. Um, um, I should say, I had a student from the Seychelles who... Who 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 came to find out how it had worked in um, in the uh, in the UK, and he, he came to Kings, where I worked there at the time, Kings in London, and in the Seychelles, they'd introduced the six-part lesson because it must be better than the three-part lesson. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it it wasn't really better than the three-part lesson. Um, so we had the three-part lesson, pedagogy exemplified, and that was supported by a substantial program of professional development, of which more later. There was, a, there was a sequence of teaching. Actually, the sequence of teaching, although it became semi-statutory, in the schools thought it was statutory, it wasn't statutory. It was just, a, it was just an exemplification. But mm. I was involved in a large research prog project that happened to be taking place at the same time as the introduction of the numeracy strategy. And it... Before the introduction of the numeracy strategy, you went into schools and the lessons looked all different. On, on a particular day, they were doing different things. A year later, every lesson looked the same. And on the same day, they were teaching the same thing. And if they weren't teaching the same thing, the teacher would apologize to you and, and they'd say, I'm sorry, the last lesson overran and we had to do that concept again. So I'm a little behind which is an amazing change in terms of how education can change. Education can really change overnight with some factors. How did that happen? Well, in part, it's, 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 it may be due to what Michael Fullan's talking, talking about here. Michael Fullan um, uh, was part of the team that uh, evaluated the, the national numeracy and natural literacy strategies. They brought in a team from what was he in, in Canada and they didn't they didn't use academics from the UK. And here's here's what Michael Fullan uh, said about the national strategies. It's the most ambitious large scale strategy of reform. He's not talking about the most ambitious in the UK. He's talking about the most ambitious worldwide. Um, the witness since the 1960s, 
and is without question the most explicit and comprehensive implement implementation-based strategy happening since then. Um, no, so it's, it's Michael Full and Wright, but it's, it's just about that. Well, let's look at the data first. We, we had the opportunity to look at the effects of the National Numeracy Strategy because we were already doing a project funded by the Levy Hume Trust that was trying to track kids through the primary years. And we had two cohorts of children, one of whom in year four had not experienced the National Numeracy Strategy and one of whom some years later in year four had experienced the National Numeracy Strategy. And we were able to test them. And this is, uh, this is what we found. We, we, we actually can compare their tests at the beginning of the year and the end of the year. And we can see a small gain. It's the same, both at the beginning and the end of the year. It's about a gain of about 3%. This is, this is just on the, 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 sc the overall score. And that's equivalent to two months of learning. Two months of learning as measured by uh, the spread of all the kids in, 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 in our national survey. And that equates to an effect size of about 0 0.17, 0 0.18, which is a pretty good effect size for system-wide change. Many of our small, relatively small-scale um, uh, interventions are getting effect sizes that are about half that and are thought to be are thought to be good. And we can look at that, um, looking at the increase in common items. I've moved to common items here because we didn't use we didn't use the same test for each year because um, we couldn't use the same test in year one as in, in in year six. We wanted a test that was reflected the curriculum in that year and that the kids could take and didn't go away feeling like they'd failed. So there were there were various there were various common items. So we can see a, we can see a nice pattern of increasing in, in, increase here plus ten percent from October uh, uh, year four October to June. Then over the summer it increases by five percent. That's about the same amount because it's a shorter period. Plus eleven percent plus four percent plus eleven percent, and then we tested them in year seven. Now we didn't test the whole lot. We tested we tested a, a, a subsample. It was it was a, an opportunity sub subsample. One of one of the schools of in 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 that small subsample was one of the best schools in the country, and we tested them with exactly the same test uh, as they'd had in year six. This wasn't a test of mathematics. It was a test really of basic number skills. It had gone down. It had gone down. It was actually less, their score at the end of year seven was actually less than their score at the end of year six. So primary was doing something, but perhaps that wasn't being sustained into, uh, into secondary. And I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. But I just want to, I just want to take a, a minute to look at um, the difference between numeracy and literacy. This is some work I've just, I mean, again, it's, it's very small. It's a, from a paper by Peter Timms in which he, he asked the question, are standards rising in English, in English primary schools? And he collected a, a series of evidence. I, I haven't collected this in order, to, in order for you to see those, those results. This is, this is, in effect, what he, what he concluded. And he was very careful, very careful to say in aggregate and he's not taken an average of those of those different effect sizes. In aggregate, the numeracy gains are about double those for reading and ga uh, for literacy, and gains for reading are smaller than those for writing. And the gains were in were made largely in the period 1995 to 2000, and thereafter we got uh, we got a plateau. So something was happening in numeracy that wasn't quite reflected in literacy. So back to Back to those uh, grade four results. So these are the these are the primary results. Here are the secondary results, and I've I've filled in. I've now filled in the uh, the intermediate stages here. Um, so um, we can see PISA 
Really great score in 2000. 2000 was a rubbish piece of that. It was a poor sample. Uh, John Micklewright reckons that the bias in that sample was such that that was really a score of 500. But it's not anchored back to 2000 was the, was the reading year, not the mathematics year. So you, have to you, you really can't compare anyway. Um, but this, I mean, I know the figures bounce around a bit, but that's, that's all average. Here, in Tim's, in 2007, our Labour politicians were terribly pleased with that result because 513 was just above average. And so it showed that there'd been an effect for the, the work that had been done in secondary. But look what happens. It goes back down to, goes back down to 507, which is no different to, uh, to average. Um, here is uh, a, uh, a graph from Julian Williams's work in which he tracked children through from age 5 to 15. Um, and we've got, the, we've got the quintiles uh, marked here. Um, and if we look in, in the middle here, what's happening here is key stage 3 is our lower secondary. We've got a plateau. We've got rises through primary and then a kind of plateau at, um, at uh, ages 12, 13 and 14. Um, it, 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 it appears to rise again at, at the end. Uh, it, you have to be very cautious of that. That might be an artifact of the data because they ended at, they ended at age, 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 um, age 14. Um, I've recently uh, looked at comparing our performance at, um, at lower secondary with our performance um, in the 1970s in various areas of the, the curriculum, algebra, decimals, ratio, and fractions. Um, and we've used some tests that were used in a, a large sample in the 1970s, and we've constructed actually a rather better sample today based on a random, uh, a random sample of, uh, of schools. I'm just going to show you the algebra results, and I'm, I'm going to show you a scatter graph in which there are sort of blue triangles that show items that have gone up. Uh, there are uncolored squares that, um, uncolored circles, I think, that that show items that haven't changed, and red, uh, red shapes that show items that have gone down. There are no blue triangles. This is algebra since the 1970s at age 14 is performing worse. Here's decimals. Well, in decimals we have a few items that have gone up, but the broad picture is things have got, it's things have got slightly worse. Perhaps worse is the increase in low attainment. The proportion of kids at the lowest end, these are, I mean, broadly speaking, these are kids who are struggling with some of the basic concepts in primary mathematics. Um, so although this says algebra, it's really structure of number. It's, not, it's certainly not, at that stage, symbolic algebra. Um, they've, they've almost doubled. I mean, in fact, in algebra and ratio, they have doubled, from about from about seven, six or seven percent to about sixteen or seventeen percent. Uh, decimals has gone has also gone up, uh, not as much. Um, uh, I, I should tell you a, another thing about about the UK. In the 1970s, we just changed to a metric decimal system. And um, so, so, uh, so this, this group, who did worse than this group, didn't know about decimals. They didn't have things like, uh, uh, like digital watches. They didn't use calculators. They had very little use of uh, number lines. When, when kids were faced with a, de with a, with a decimal, they said, oh, I don't like decimals. I'll change it to a fraction. Now they say, I don't like fractions, I'll change it to a decimal. But they've got worse. This should have got, um, of all the areas, this, this is the one that should have got better. But actually, worryingly, back to that primary data, 
and back to that study that we did looking across the cohort, the lowest 10 and 5% in the national numeracy strategy similarly didn't do as well as the middle and higher tenors. So, why has most reform not worked? Well, we've probably wasted effort trying to change the wrong things. Some time ago, I, uh, I carried out with Mike Askew a, s a survey literature review of, the, of what high attaining countries knew about their, their mathematics. Um, there was no evidence to suggest that as we have done, that putting interactive whiteboards into every classroom at vast expense and, um, at, and, and funding two particular companies would have any effect. Um, so we've probably done that. We have a very, we have high stakes tests and those high stakes tests are high stakes for schools and they're the same tests that are high stakes for schools and for kids. All systems have high stakes tests for kids but we have the same high stakes tests for, um, for kids and schools and, and actually for teachers. And we've got a very fragmented objective di driven lessons. That's uh, it's very instrumental teaching and learning is what Elfsted say about our, our mathematics. What happens in classrooms, of course, is not the only factor. We've seen about decimalization. Though we might have hoped the decimalization might have made things better. Um, and if we look to big studies in the States, I, I, I mean if you're familiar with Larry Kubin's Larry Kubin's work. I mean, Larry Kubin's book about, about the last century of educational change in the States is, is a lovely book to, uh, to read. It's, it, he uses, he uses uh, photographs and fragments of, um, of things that happen in class to show that nothing has changed. Um, I mean, things th the clothes look different, but basically not much, has, uh, not much has, has, has changed. And he argues that actually schools tend to reinterpret new initiatives from existing perspectives. So, so schools, as we all do, we try and figure out how to make it work. And one of the ways in which to make it work is to do what you've always done. Um, and we've got a short-term policy and reform cycle. And that's particularly true in, in the UK. Um, I recently, as part of some work around participation post-16, I, I, I looked at the, p the policy framework in a number of countries around the world, uh, including some European countries and including Singapore and New Zealand. And universally, those countries had a longer-term vision. Um, uh, I should say that in each case, the policy cycle was reducing, uh, so it it was a kind of it was a kind of worry. But the, the the policy cycle in the UK is about four years, and that's not enough to to see educational change. Educational change is really slow, um, and if we're trying to see it over over four years we inevitably move towards game plan. Um, so, but the good news is one thing did work, I think, and that's the national numeracy strategy. And it was something I didn't think would work. I can remember saying to people, I think this is rubbish. I didn't like the professional development. And I wasn't alone there. I didn't like how the stuff was explained to teachers. I was wrong, I think. Um, why did it work? Well, is it because of Michael Fullens that it's a big thing? So is it? Is it, is it money and resourcing? Is it increasing accountability? Is it that it was a key government initiative? Is it, as Larry Kubin says, the primary is more amenable to reform? Well, I'm not sure. I suspect this is a, this is a key factor. I'm not sure those are the key factors in the change because everything else has cost money. We've had accountability for other things. We've had other key, key government initiatives, so there must be something else. I'm sure those are part of it, but there must be something else. 
It's also worth reflecting on the numeracy versus literacy. And, and it may be that there was more potential for change in numeracy. I suspect primary teachers' mathematics is weaker. Um, uh, Owen, Owen McNamara's research into what primary teachers reported about the numeracy strategy was they said, it's marvellous, they've told us what it means. So, I mean, that, I mean that's a good place to be if, if teachers are thinking that. Um, it may be that the national numeracy strategy was better evidenced, better researched, particularly around addition and subtraction. I think less, less well about multiplication and, and division. It may be that literacy actually is, is, is about factors beyond the classroom. And it may be, it may be this, this factor here, that, that actually the way to improve reading is to get, is to get parents to read with the chil children, and that's going to be quite hard. You don't just have to convince them, you've got to create the time for them to do that. So, why really did the NNS work? Well, I, I, I think there are several key factors. And um, I'm drawing on this book, Primary Mathematics and the Developing Professional, because as part of that study, we were able to look at the professional development. One, it was pedagogy and curriculum. And, and for all, uh, all of what we thought at the time, that it was top-down, that it was completely controlled, it wasn't. It gave some flexibility, but it gave some. It, it, I think it empowered it empowered teachers, and I, it, it specifically, it had good tools and models, both to help kids learning, and to help teacher learning, and it those supported teacher knowledge. Uh, I mean, in particular, we had this tool. Uh, uh, for those of you in mathematics, this is a counting stick. It's a really simple tool. It's a meter stick that is marked in different, in ten, in ten alternating colours. And you can use it for a whole series of things. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, etc. And you can do things about the structure of number in terms of the number line, the structure of number in terms of uh, repeated addition, the structure of number in terms of multiplication. This was used, in my anecdotal evidence, between about 1998 and 2000. Thereafter, when I've gone round when I've gone round schools, you quite often find this counting stick in the teacher's cupboard, having been used to stir paint. <laughs> so, in a sense, one of the one of the problems was we didn't maintain what was a simple, usable tool, and we didn't maintain, sustain that. Um, secondly, Ofsted and the Key Stage 2 test, they mattered. It mattered that people were going around and looking, and it mattered that there was a test. It was a key government focus. I, th I, I, think, that, I, think, that, I think that I think that mattered. But crucially, the involvement of the head teachers was important. The first professional development session for schools didn't involve teachers. It involved two people from our school, the head teacher and the numeracy coordinator. The head teacher was involved centrally in curriculum and pedagogy as a pedagogue. They were, they were, not, they were not just accountable for it, they were trained in what they were going to expect their kids to, their, not their kids, their teachers, uh, their teachers to do. And finally, and this bears on the short termism thing, we might think of this as a labour policy. It actually continued <coughs> a right wing government initiative, the National Numeracy Pilot. So we had, we had continuity across administrations. We had an initiative that didn't come in with a new government, that was picked up from where an old government had left off. Ran within a different direction, but there was continuity across those two things. 
What happened after 2003 uh, or after 2000? Well, there was a shift towards generic pedagogy. Uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in formative assessment, but it's difficult to implement. And it's generic, tends to be traffic lights, no hands up, um, rather than the didactics that was the mathematical pedagogy that was evident in the, in the national numeracy strategy materials. And of course, we had learning styles and uh, visual, audio, kinesthetic. We actually, we actually had some guidance from government that said, use back. We actually had that, and it was sent to all schools. And, and many of, as I've said, many of the particular pedagogical tools disappeared. One, one of the, the things that our, our, our current Minister of State, um, Nick Gibb, came in uh, to government with, he, he talked about particular methods that had been used in the, the numeracy strategy. Uh, he, he, was, he was very uh, critical of, of two things, a, a chunking method and a grid method. Both of those are, both of those are tools, and I'm not going to show you what they are, but they're tools that are kind of stepping stones for going further. I would be equally critical as Nick Gibb if they become the thing that we want to teach. But as stepping stones, they're terribly, terribly useful. And we kind of lost the meaning of them. They'd become procedures rather than kind of conceptual tools. There was, a, there was also a shift towards managerialism. And actually, I don't think it's the managerialism that's the problem so much as that entails moving head teachers away from being pedagogues from being heads of teaching who are interested in teaching first and foremost and know about teaching. And, of course, what happens is increase, increase game, game play. So, how could we improve educational standards? Well, we know that teachers tend to reinterpret new initiatives from existing perspectives, so what do we do? Should we have a complex and centralising policy environment or should we work with teachers, should we provide an environment that helps them do something different? Does high stakes, does a high stakes accountability regime in which the accountability for schools is, is synonymous with, the, with what we're trying to achieve for kids, is that the way to do it? I suspect not. Um, and of course we have an obsession with success. It is impossible for a school to try out a new initiative and report failure. Yet we know that we've got to fail in order to know, you know what works. The research is fragmented. There's little scaling up uh, um, and there's little on the cost or comparative benefits. The Education Endowment Foundation in, the, in, in England is starting to do work on that. But we're about 50 years away from where we should be, I think. Um, there's perhaps too much focus on early years and we should uh, on, on primary and we should focus on the early years and, and and secondary the early years is where we close the gap the secondary is where we is where we saw that saw that plateau and we should perhaps remember the primary in england is pretty good but we tend to think the primary is 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 pretty bad i mean i, I think i've shown you evidence that yes the primary is pretty good and we should be focusing elsewhere and we should aim for a longer term policy and reform cycle, but that's, that's really difficult. But we should provide policy makers, I think, with tools that enable them to see continuity or to, 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 to do continuity across, across political administrations. And we should have policy tools that recognize that when a politician comes in, they've got to appear to do something different, but that we know that doing some of the same things uh, matters. Um, and there are many reasons now to be be cheerful about mathematics education in the UK. We've got, we've got much more problem solving. We've got a revised national curriculum. We're, we're going to do maths to 18, which I, I, I like. Matt, some of you may not. Uh, we've, got, we've, got a, we've got a, we've got an, a, a substantial initiative around, around, um, around uh, uh, professional development. But we really haven't learned. We really haven't learned about the lessons from the National Numeracy Strategy, uh, 
And uh, the accepted wisdom is the primary mathematics is poor and the national numeracy strategy was a failure. It wasn't. We aren't where I'd like to be, but it wasn't a failure and we should be, we should be learning from that. And I'll stop there.